welcome everyone to our webinar for today. Um, GL Communications tries to do a webinar once a month toward the end of the month and uh, this is our July edition. So we're excited to present to you um, some WAN impairment simulation products that we have and just talk about that whole environment and what it what it means to uh, introduce a uh, an impairment simulator into a network. Uh, so we're going to focus on packet networks, and, of course, and, and TDM analog networks. So the title of it is WAN Impairment Simulation for Packet and TDM Analog Networks. Um, we, we welcome everyone again. My name again is, is Matthew Yost or Matt Yost, and uh, I'm joined by a couple colleagues here. Um, first will be VJ Kolkarni and he will be helping with some of the technical aspects. He uh, um, may pass off to a couple other people named Prasad Maya and John Phipps. And again, those guys will help out with some of the technical requirements and some of the, the user interfaces for our products to explain those. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, if you don't know about GL, if you're new to GL Communications, I'll, I'll briefly tell you about us. Uh, we're located in the United States. We're in Gaithersburg, Maryland, and we were founded back in 1986. We have um, basically kind of two divisions to our company. One of them is related to engineering consulting services. So we help uh, with engineering, system engineering, consulting work for local, state, and federal government agencies mainly, transit agencies, as well as some private uh, consulting work. The um, other division of GL, which we're talking about today, uh, the topic is about um, a product uh, that we have, multiple products that GL offers, and that's our test and measurement equipment. So we uh, manufacture, um, basically from A to Z, um, uh, test and measurement equipment, so commercial off-the-shelf equipment um, that we market and sell to the industry, and those industries are widely varying. Um, um, we've we've had sales to to many oddball industries throughout throughout the world, uh, but wireless, VoIP, Sonnet, TDM solutions are are what we are what we specialize in. Uh, all of our products, I'd say, 99% of them are uh, sort of PC based in a sense. So that means that you usually have a, a, a very clean, easy to use Windows, uh, Microsoft Windows um, graphical user interface. Um, so it's, it's, it's very ease of use for your technicians, your engineers and, and so forth. So that's who we are. Um, our topic today, again, is WAN emulation and impairment simulation. Um, we're gonna do a brief introduction on on what packet TDM impairment platforms our our platforms look like physically um, we'll get into some theory on you know packet TDM and analog impairments and we'll describe a little bit about what these impairments um, mean so when we say packet loss or packet delay what do we mean by that um, some things are going to be obvious others you know uh, you know, there's, there's a little bit of complexity to how we do things. So um, that, that's sort of the topic. We're going to start with packet. We'll go to the TDM. We may have a short break after the packet impairment uh, section of this. That's, that's a major section. And then we're going to conclude with our TDM impairments, um, T1, E1, T3, OC3, etc., and analog impairments. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'll, I'll let VJ set the stage for us. Yeah. Okay. So I wanted to mention one thing uh, briefly. Uh, what we're not covering today is a measurement of impairments, which uh, okay. uh, we have a whole suite of software that uh, covers a measurement of uh, uh, network impairments. And that's, uh, of course, uh, also very essential in, uh, uh, in understanding networks. Um, what we're focusing on today is just the generation of impairments, or the aspects of our tools that are uh, associated with generating impairments so that in the lab environment you can easily uh, simulate a network. Yeah, it's a good point. So um, thanks for reminding me of that. The, this, 
this particular set of uh, product suites that we're going to be presenting today are injecting problems, impairments into the network. Um, most of GL's, I'll say most of GL's uh, product suites that we offer in all of these arenas, packet, TDM, et cetera, are related to measuring quality, doing intrusive testing on the network. So you're actually testing the network, getting statistics from the network. This is now, these products are now trying to simulate the network for you, for lab environments and so forth. So that's a very good point. Okay, um, VJ, if you'd like to sort of give us an sure. overview of what's going to happen here. Okay, thank you, Matt. That was good. Um, so, uh, just to get set the stage, uh, you know, we're dealing with a uh, a network that is in transition. Uh, the new technology called Packet. Everybody is moving towards it. Uh, enterprises are obviously moving in that direction. Government uh, agencies that use Data networks, voice networks are moving to that uh, uh, standard PSTN analog TDM technology is uh, being replaced with packet. So we are in a vast transition phase. And uh, of course, the reason why packet is so important or has been found to be so uh, um, advantageous uh, is because um, it provides one network that can handle various traffic types, voice, data, image, video. Whereas in the TDM world, as you know, we had disparate networks, um, uh, networks for voice, circuit switched TDM networks for voice. There was an entire hierarchy. Voice was a, 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 you know, a large uh, traffic and service market. Um, and uh, the whole optical sonnet SDH technology evolved for that uh, for that service, um, and then data networks to support burgeoning data traffic had this uh, utilized the uh, uh, underlying sonnet SDH technology for, uh, but in a dedicated fashion for uh, supporting data needs. So you would normally partition some of the voice network uh, for data and dedicate that for data, and you would build data networks uh, and uh, uh, multiplexers and uh, all sorts of uh, devices that were engineered specifically for data. But they, again, used the same underlying technology, the, the optical uh, core, optical SDH technology, Sonnet, which evolved from the previous technology, which was uh, the hierarchy of T1s, E1s, T3s, E3s, and T4, E4s, et cetera. So they went to a sonnet optical synchronous technology. Um, but then that is now being, that same fiber uh, infrastructure is being used to carry direct ethernet signals at up to even, what, 400 gigabits per second. So. Uh, the core technology is this, is this fiber technology. Uh, the, the important thing about packet, again, is this uh, one network handles all traffic. And the packet, sort of like an envelope, carries uh, traffic of any kind. And if you unravel that packet, you might see voice, data, image, or video. Uh, and it is carried in digitized format. So these days, uh, majority of the traffic is video, YouTube, Netflix, and so on, As um, whereas prior to that, we were carrying those in separate cable networks or satellite networks or, or so on. Um, so a packet is handled uniformly by the switches in the network, um, and a packet is routed hop by hop until it reaches the destination. So that's a very important distinction. Whereas in the TDM network, um, uh, we had this essentially streaming synchronous uh, bit streams uh, that were set up for voice uh, on a call by call basis. So that's a very important distinction. Um, this, uh, even though there may be some disadvantages to packet, 
in one way or another, its overall advantages is convergence of uh, and handling of traffic uniformly. Um, so one important distinction or one important similarity is this fundamentally it's using the optical technology. Uh, the access technology can be either optical or copper uh, or other uh, transmission media. Uh, so the underlying error mechanisms are the same, whether it's for packet or sonnet or, or for TDM, that is. And that is bit errors occur as a function of the transmission quality. And that is usually optical, it's usually very, very clean, unless of course you have some, you know, your uh, some maintenance issues or or you're running uh, extremely, going across transatlantic or transpacific and you're really stressing the optics. Uh, so generally speaking, it's a very clean, uh, error-free, almost error-free environment or very low error environment. But the underlying mechanism of errors is still the same. Bit errors in the packet, if you're sending packets, bit errors turn into packet errors. So one bit error could you could theoretically create an entire packet. You could have a 1500 byte packet that is thrown away because of one single bit error. Uh, now that sounds extreme, but on the other hand, there are a lot of advantages to packet that overcome that. In the TDM world, one bit error remains as one bit error. It probably will not affect voice or video or any other of those traffic services, uh, but it will, um, it will just be accepted and it will probably not have any impact um, on the on the actual service. <clears throat> so there is that one distinction. So we'll probably be talking about that as we go forward. Okay. So again, the TDM, <clears throat> we were we were having these separate uh, circuit switch dedic and uh, dedicated data networks. Um, so uh, one of the one of the distinguishing features of TDM uh, is that it is asynchronous. Uh, technology. In other words, there's one optical, there's one clock, one timing system, and it has a hierarchy. It has these DS0 64 kilobit channels, which are then packed together, multiplexed together to T1s and E1s, and then those are further uh, multiplexed into higher transmission rates. So uh, there is this propagation of errors through this multiplexing hierarchy uh, that causes uh, bit errors are turned into, if they're severe enough, they turn into uh, uh, alarms or bursts of errors or uh, the multiplexing itself causes a certain amount of jitter that can cause errors. So that there is that um, that technology, the way it is, it is uh, structured can have uh, an, an effect on the entire hierarchy, whereas in the packet world, if one packet is in error, it is only that particular packet, and nothing, it does not affect the entire uh, architecture. So that's a very important uh, distinction there. So we have, in the TDM world, we have bit errors, bipolar violations, frame errors, frame errors that are associated with the different frame structures, and, and those are used to manage and maintain the TDM network. And, uh, so that becomes a little bit onerous, uh, whereas in the packet world, we have only one kind of um, packet technology and one kind of hardware that switches packets. So it's much more uniform and hopefully a little bit more easier managing it. Managing it. The one advantage that TDM has, of course, is that it has lower delay because of the fact that bits have to be stored and forwarded rather than packets. A packet could be a large size. A packets can be queued. TDM uh, bits are not necessarily queued. They're just synchronously transmitted. And um, so there's, there's less delay, less jitter. There's, uh, other than call switching, there's no real congestion. Whereas in the packet world, there may be congestion depending on how you, how you size the network. In TDM, there is no sharing of resources. And that's where uh, there's another big distinction between packet and TDM. In packet, you, we are sharing the underlying sonnet 
uh, architecture or packet architecture, the switches, core switches uh, for um, for any kind of traffic. And uh, and and when when voice is silent, when there is no speech, that same time period can be used or shared by other traffic. So there's a there's this a statistical multiplexing that is inherent in packet switching, which is uh, essentially sharing of that technology for all sorts of traffic. Now, analog networks are a what originally the entire network was made of. It was analog circuit switching, which then later turned into the digital technology because analog uh, traffic can always be digitized and packetized and transmitted that way um, because analog signals have a finite bandwidth, right? So as we know from theory, anything that has finite bandwidth can be digitized as long as it is sampled at some, at some rate that preserves the content. So eventually, end users, like we're doing now, have to have analog uh, we process analog information. Machines, of course, can process, um, does not process analog information. They can process data. So that's the big differences. Okay. Um, well, we want to give a, a brief introduction here to uh, the GL platforms that we offer these emulators on and these uh, impairment simulators. So uh, when we look at them physically, um, if you're familiar with GL's products, we're using some of our our sort of um, standard platforms, uh, our packet expert platforms, and our what we call our T probe platform, which uh, packet expert is, is sort of our standard uh, Ethernet based testing hardware. Hardware, and we can kind of package that in different flavors, um, one gig, ten gig, and so on. Um, now, one thing I'd like to say about this is uh, application wise. Um, is probably the most important thing to say. We we expect this, we see this, we see these um, simulators, these impairment simulators being placed in one's lab and um, your network sort of flowing through them. So if, uh, you know, if, you're looking, if you're thinking of a network diagram here, this guy is sort of the network cloud sitting uh, in your lab and it has the ability to be turned on and off and varied the amount of impairments and so forth. So we have a very easy to use graphical user interfaces to control that. We have schedulers to schedule problems, impairments to happen. Um, and it's one of those things where you can turn it on and turn it off. You can share the resource within the lab. Um, and we can get into a little bit of how, how that's all done here later. but. Uh, the platforms, uh, to get back to the platforms a little bit, we have one, one gig platforms and 10 gig platforms, as well as on the TDM side, we have T1, E1, um, analog FXO, FXS, uh, sort of two wire platforms. So all these guys can be um, used in, in a portable, we'll call it a semi-portable unit, which is a USB unit, can plug into a laptop. Um, portable uh, in nature, or you can we can rack it in what we're what we're coming out with here, and what we've released um, one of our rack mount platforms we call the M Top, and that basically is just a flexible uh, platform to plug in these different modules of our products, so a packet module, a TDM module, and so forth. So. Uh, that's what we want to, wanted to say about our, our hardware platform. Some of our representatives on the line are probably very familiar with these products. These are uh, the similar products that we've been using in the past to do analysis and measurements and things like that. They've been sort of repurposed in the sense to do these um, network simulations, impairment simulations. Um, this slide uh, basically Get, gets a, a, a slightly different perspective, but it's all related to the TDM portion of network uh, simulators. So again, our T-Probe is our, our, is our workhorse here. Uh, we also have some T3 and E3 analyzers that can be um, used for um, WAN simulators. 
And um, we also have on top of that, um, our Lightspeed 1000 platform, which is a OC3, OC12, and Sonnet-based um, piece of hardware. So all of these uh, different modules, whatever your medium is, um, your network, uh, we generally have a product that can cover that and be um, set up as a network simulator, WAN network simulator. As we move forward here, we'll get into some of how these impairments in the packet world um, are defined and what they what they actually mean. So uh, just to give a quick overview, and then we'll have a slide for each of them, um, and we'll quickly go through them. But if you're talking about a packet error in the Ethernet uh, pa packet world, or within the Ethernet frame, um, a portion of that that Ethernet packet is a, the FCS, the, the frame uh, check sequence in CRC. If there's an error that occurs in that, uh, what happens in the packet world is that packet is discarded. And um, we have the ability to do that, and that's this is talking about that. Now, if it's a UDP packet, you know, that's not, necessarily a big deal for the end user applications if it's tcp then we'll you know that tcp protocol goes into its sort of retransmission phase and make sure that that packet gets delivered to the end so uh, packet error is one thing packet loss or packet discarded um, similar thing there packet drops so those things occur due to congestion that's a normal type thing that's a um or you know maybe the time to live on the packet has expired and there's more checksum error so th these are traditional sort of impairments that one would expect to have in in a, a wan impairment simulator packet loss we can dial up a very specific um, rate of packet loss and drop packets packet delay so each packet individually, how, how long is it delayed as it goes through the WAN simulator? Um, and we can do that, we can queue those. Um, lower speeds have a lot of delay. Most delay is encountered at lower speed access egress lines. Uh, the backbone is generally super fast. So um, we have ways, and you'll see here within our software to introduce just straight packet delay. Now. When we talk about packet jitter, that's obviously the variation in delays, sort of the wave of delay uh, as it as it gets accumulated. And those those jitter buffers are very relevant, of course, at the end users there, where there's jitter buffers on on net, uh, network endpoints and so forth. So you'll see how we can, uh, with our simulators, we can introduce these real world sort of real world real application type impairments. We can also do packet reordering, so taking packets and reshuffling them a little bit, and we can duplicate packets. And we also have the, the ability to do uh, sort of throttling of the bandwidth. So you can sort of throttle bandwidth, um, you know, and see how that affects your your uh, in in nodes and so forth. So all of these things are what you would expect a WAN packet simulator to be able to do. They're real world impairments that are encountered in the real world. We have the ability within our products to set those up and um, turn them on and off at will manually. We can do a scheduled approach to that. We can sort of ramp up, ramp down, things of that nature you're going to see. Okay, so Matt, talk to you about all of these impairments that are inherent in packet networks. Matt was explaining how packets, uh, this information, end-to-end -end information, is uh, packetized, right? Snippets of information are, uh, are packetized and transported. So obviously a snippet of information that's in a packet is not the total information that is relevant to the end applications, and they have to go about uh, uh, putting the information back together, putting all these envelopes back in their proper order, uh, either asking for retransmissions of packets that were lost, and, and so on. So uh, that is an inherent uh, problem associated with packet, and the protocols, uh, the end-to-end -end protocols, either would 
deal with those types of issues or they would tolerate them. And um, so one of the important uh, uh, problems for end-to-end -end applications is how much these applications, how much bandwidth can these applications actually run at? And that depends, of course, on the degree of packet loss that exists in the network. Uh, but in any case, the end applications are very sensitive to these packet impairments. And so when you, when Matt said that you can uh, easily put, put this rack of equipment in a, in a lab and plug in uh, to this uh, equipment and dial up all of these errors, you can see how these applications will um, behave uh, to these different packet uh, rates, packet drops, and so on. Um, so generally, when, you, uh, when you're dealing with the packet world, you're dealing with these service level agreements, and uh, you subscribe to a quality of service, and that is called the service level agreement. So if you have an Ethernet service uh, that you're using heavily for your end-to-end -end applications, you will probably sign a service level agreement, unless you're using the open Internet, uh, in which case uh, you, uh, are, you get what you uh, get, essentially. Um, and then here, in this case, you get these, uh, diff uh, for example, let's take a look at this to the left side here, um, this packet loss. Generally, packet loss is given in terms of percentages. 0.005% uh, to 1% would be a typical range. Latency would be something like 36 to 75 milliseconds. Availability is 99% to 99.9%. So these, these are typical service level agreements that uh, you would be signing up for and you would be paying uh, uh, to the degree of, uh, of quality that you uh, expected. And this is what these WAN impairment emulators will allow you to emulate precisely. Uh, you can dial up the exact packet loss, latency, and, and uh, uh, other impairments. So um, uh, now, so here is, uh, I think Matt already talked to you about packet discard. There are multiple ways of packet, that packets can get discarded. Uh, here we're just showing you uh, one way, which is the FCS errors errors in the IP header checksum, congestion can cause packet discard. Uh, back to the TCP throughput. So these TCP applications either have one or two uh, protocols for retransmission. One is called go back N, and the other is called selective repeat. Uh, if you are a, a high bandwidth user and you need high, very uh, high throughput, generally you would use a selective repeat. And I will show you here how that works. Here's a typical end-to-end -end example where if, you, if, if there is latency in the network or if there's packet loss, uh, how does that affect your throughput? So your end application, if you notice here, uh, will send these packets to the other end. And when, uh, when the uh, that end, when it receives these packets, it will be normally sending acknowledgments, which refresh what is called the TCP window. That TCP window then allows the transmitter to continue transmitting. Remember, in TCP applications, everything has to be 100% correct. So if you had a delayed AC, uh, as is shown here, you will get this amount of idle period in the application. The application cannot maintain uh, due to the rules of the protocol, cannot make, cannot send the next packet until the acknowledgement is uh, uh, arrives for the first packet. So uh, these type of, and packet losses, of course, would would trigger this retransmission scheme. Uh, this here we're just showing a delayed act, but the same principle applies for uh, 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 for lost packets or discarded packets. Okay. Uh, if you have an application like a UDP application, which is, for example, is commonly used for voice, uh, uh, voice over IP, they use session initiation protocol. And there, although um, uh, a session initiation protocol is a uh, UDP-based protocol and uses uh, UDP, and these uh, these applications 
will essentially are, are a little bit more tolerant to, um, uh, to packet loss. Uh, however, there is a degree to, uh, that there's, there's a point where that uh, toleration is uh, results in actually degradation. So here is a, a, a typical uh, graph that shows you uh, conversational MOS score. I mean, opinion score, this is a voice quality metric that says that, hey, if you're getting beyond four to eight, uh, four to eight percent packet loss, your voice quality will be affected. So that's assuming, of course, uh, you're running mu law or a law, and you're using the conventional codex. If you're using codex that are more um, stringent, then it might be worse. Uh, we talked about this, latency, jitter, and TCP throughput. They're very interrelated because of that TCP window scheme. So that, again, is what you would normally be using these WAN emulators for. You want to see how your applications uh, behave uh, uh, as a function of latency or, or perhaps excessive latency or, uh, or excessive loss. Um, so this is uh, the ship that tells you that there is Essentially, there is a, um, a, a diminishing returns as the packet, as the latency and or packet loss increases. Packet reordering, same thing. Uh, the higher, the end-to-end -end TCP protocols behave very much similarly. If they receive a packet that is reordered, uh, uh, then they treat that as uh, requesting a retransmission. They're not going to sit there and wait for the reordered packets or, or the out-of-sequence packets to arrive because that requires some buffering and, and so on. So they may implement a very simple uh, TCP protocol that essentially discards all out-of-sequence packets. There is a, a, another protocol that TCP can use, which is selective retransmissions, which I would assume that uh, more higher bandwidth applications would use that would incur the buffering and wait for the out-of-sequence packets and rearrange them. That way, the throughput will not be affected as much. Uh, and this is just a depiction of how this packet reordering can significantly reduce the packet throughput of end-to-end -end applications. Uh, now, there's something called packet duplication in the network. So these are all actual impairments that happen in the network, and they've been... Um, and they're there for certain reasons because the protocol, for example, packet, du uh, this packet duplication could easily occur because of the ARP protocol, which is used to discover uh, connectivity, distributed connectivity. Uh, or packet duplication can happen because you've asked for a retransmission. The end of protocol has asked for a retransmission. So now you've got essentially... Uh, the delayed packet and a new packet entering the network that are actually duplicates of each other. So, uh, again, so this is something that can actually happen in the network, and we want to be able to simulate that. Um, uh, so quickly now, packet, the, the platforms that we use, Matt talked to you a little bit about this. These are the two platforms that we are, uh, are generally used for, uh, that, that we can put into a, a rack uh, mount uh, uh, type of um, uh, enclosure and, and easily uh, plug into and and out of uh, for impairment reasons. And uh, I think this is probably uh, similarly for the TDM. We do the same thing. Okay. Uh, now, what we're going to do is we're going to try to go through some of these slides a little bit quickly because we have other webinar recordings that actually dealt with uh, these same impairments in greater detail so that uh, uh, you could probably peruse those recordings as well to understand how some of these impairments uh, are actually, I mean, go more greater detail into how these impairments actually affect your application. Okay. So now we're going to actually go into how our products perform these impairments and I'll try to get uh, either John or uh, Prasad to help me with the, the GUI-based uh, applications that, uh, by the way, they can be GUI-based or command line, um, and you can have them scripted as well. But here's a bird's-eye view 
of what our WAN IP emulator can do. And as you can see here, there are two directions to this. And uh, perhaps I'll have uh, um, Prasad, maybe uh, you take over here and start describing this. Uh, okay, so uh, this slide here uh, shows how the impairment is actually introduced by our uh, the packet expert. Uh, uh, the packet expert is a platform, and IP net sim is the uh, application on top of that platform. Uh, we have other applications for traffic generation uh, and BERT analysis and RFC 2544 on the same platform. But here uh, we'll be talking about this IP net sim platform. So um, uh, if, if, as you can see in this figure, uh, so the traffic is, uh, the IP net sim is uh, put uh, where the traffic flows. For example, here between LAN A on the left hand side to LAN B. Uh, and uh, uh, between uh, port 1 and port 2. And uh, impairments can be introduced independently in uh, the both directions from LAN A to LAN B and LAN B to LAN A. Uh, so uh, uh, the IP net sim um, uh, helps, uh, provides the ability to classify the incoming traffic into separate streams based on the packet headers, like uh, the IP address or the MAC address or the VLAN ID or uh, the UDP or uh, uh, TCP ports and uh, classify them into separate streams. And for each stream, the set of impairments can be applied uh, separately. So uh, the traffic that comes in from, uh, for example, say port one is uh, classified by this stream definition, which is uh, all user defined and uh, split into multiple streams. <laughs> and for each streams, uh, this is the order in which uh, the impairments are introduced. Uh, so first, uh, uh, the latency is applied, then the bandwidth control, which is a sort of uh, traffic policing algorithm. <coughs> then uh, the packet effects like um, packet loss or drop, reordering, duplication uh, is introduced. And then uh, finally, uh, the error insertion the logic error insertion is um, done and uh, all the streams are multiplexed and sent out on port 2 to the destination. Similarly, in the reverse direction, uh, same thing happens, but in the reverse uh, uh, order. Uh, so uh, the various uh, uh, specifications uh, we have here, like bandwidth control, we can uh, define from anywhere from 1 kbps up to 10 gbps and the latency uh, can be introduced from uh, 0 to 1.5 0 milliseconds up to 1.5 seconds in terms of milliseconds uh, for 1 gbps and up to 0.5 seconds for 10 gbps and uh, latency can be introduced in three ways one is the single or constant delay and uh, other two are distributed delays either uniform or random distributed uh, the last two are uh, can be used to simulate the jitter and the packet loss rate can be introduced anywhere from 0 to 100 percent reordering rate uh, again uh, up to 100 percent uh, with the uh, reordering uh, always requires a delay of when to reintroduce the packet so that delay it can be delayed up to uh, two seconds and then reintroduced into the stream and uh, uh, packet duplication up to 100 percent and uh, logic error insertion rate in terms of uh, the ratio uh, 10 power minus 1 up to 10 power minus 9. So uh, these are some of the features here. Uh, so using the bandwidth emulation, uh, we can simulate uh, different kinds of uh, WAN links like T1, E1, T3, E3. It all, uh, it, it's all based on the setting of the bandwidth. And uh, so uh, once the traffic is classified, the statistics are provided for each stream and also the total statistics per port. And as Vijay talked, uh, we have a command line interface uh, uh, for automat uh, testing automation. And uh, we have recently added one more feature, which is the scheduler, um, because uh, using the GUI, uh, the user can introduce only one set of impairments at a time. So um, we have added the scheduler to vary the impairments over time. Uh, 
and uh, uh, talking about the classifier uh, or the stream definition uh, we have uh, raw and packet mode uh, with uh, uh, which which provides a lot of flexibility for uh, con uh, doing the traffic classification so i wanted to mention here Prasad, just one thing that we you and i talked about earlier uh, this uh, ability of the I, our IP nets in the RWAN emulator here, uh, the ability of it to define streams and also be able to specifically hit packets that are of a particular nature. Like, for example, you could hit the TCP ACK packet or you could hit the UDP packet of a certain variety. So that type of capability exists in this product and uh, that allows you to to rigorously test your applications. That's an uh, important uh, thing. Uh, now, Prasad already talked about a little bit about this multi-stream. So our product has uh, these ports, one gig ports or, or four one gig or, or uh, two 10 gig or one gig. So you might think that the number of ports is a limiting factor, but the fact that you can do this multi-stream emulation or you can define up to 16 streams within the one gig stream gives you a lot of flexibility, it's sort of like having essentially uh, a device with 16 ports on it. Uh, so this gives you the definition. In addition, of course, you could front end our equipment with a switch that allows you to mix the traffic together and then funnel it into uh, this IP net sim for further definition of these of these streams. Um, uh, so, Prasad, you want to? Uh, this is the, the, the uh, ability to do the latency and the jitter. And um, um, we, we have all of these capabilities where you can uh, introduce uh, either a single delay of, of latency or you can uh, create a distribution, a probability distribution uh, between one, like for example, in this case, we, we can see highlighted there that in the direction of P2 to P1, we have a uniform probability distribution. Uh, that means that uh, it's equally, <clears throat> it, with equal probability, uh, you could get three to 1,250 milliseconds of latency. And the other impairments have not been defined in this particular case. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, bandwidth control. Why would you, you want to use bandwidth control? This goes back to our service level agreement. Uh, you're not necessarily going to get infinite bandwidth from uh, from the provider. You're going to be getting it for a certain amount of bandwidth, beyond which uh, there's going to be either some sort of policing of that traffic or a rejection of that traffic, and there, that's also talked about a little bit further down. So that's why bandwidth control is an important aspect of, of WAN emulation. The, uh, Ethernet networks, you get one, um, you get this wire speed interface at one gig or ten gig or, or higher rates. That doesn't mean that you have, you can blast away at those rates because the network provider is going to be metering that traffic and allowing only a certain amount of traffic to uh, uh, to flow uh, based on what you're paying for it. So, um, so here is. Uh, Prasad, you want to explain policing and shaping? Uh, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so uh, there are uh, two types of uh, uh, the bandwidth control uh, generally um, done by uh, provided by service providers. One is uh, traffic policing, and other is shaping. And uh, uh, the policing is uh, a sort of uh, uh, somewhat. Uh, crude method where uh, uh, there is no buffering or uh, 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 shaping the traffic. Uh, so whenever uh, the traffic incoming the uh, traffic bandwidth exceeds a certain limit, uh, which is a cutoff limit, uh, then those packets are discarded and uh, the uh, transmission is uh, resumed only when the rate uh, goes below the cutoff limit. So as you can see in the top graph, and shaping is um, uh, is when uh, when the traffic uh, exceeds the limit, it is uh, stored, 
uh, by the service provider and uh, uh, and then uh, sent at the cutoff rate okay. so uh, in in our uh, thing uh, we uh, mostly do the traffic policing method so that uh, uh, users can simulate the network where traffic policing is in effect it is just another view of the same thing where these um, 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 quality of service kicks in, essentially. Packet loss um, is what we talked about. Is, I mean, obviously, the packet loss is one of the most uh, uh, frequently... Uh, latency and packet loss are the two uh, most frequent um, uh, impairments seen in WAN networks, in packet WAN networks. And uh, packet loss, of course, we talked about how all the different uh, ways that packet loss can occur uh, due to congestion, uh, transmission errors, um, um, simply a jitter buffer overflow, uh, and so on. There's really a, a, a checksum errors, uh, IP header errors, and so on. So there's quite a number of ways that packet loss can happen. And of course, delay is something that's unavoidable because of the store and forward nature of packets. So this is, uh, allows us to give a lot of variability and distribution for packet loss. And this is just another view of how that can be done on these up to 16 streams over a one gig uh, network. We can do it periodically, we can do it with uniform distribution, randomly and so on. So these are, this is uh, trying to depict that capability here. Um, so this is uh, packet loss. This is also packet loss. I'm just showing you that you can also have burst packet loss or you can create manual packet loss. And manual pack packet loss, of course, might be a useful thing to do when you're trying to uh, create an event, uh, a one-of event, and see what the uh, what the um, effect of that would be. For example, perhaps you would just hit the TCP ACK and see what happens to the application or or um, or the one packet of that stream. Uh, packet reordering, uh, as we said, because of the nature of packet networks and the fact that there is not, as in circuit switching, there is not this one path uh, from source to destination. It, that that's that's the uh, inherent difference between packet and circuit. Um, there is only one path in circuit, and that path is fixed for the life of that connection until it is again reestablished. It could be a different path, but in packet, um, a connection is a virtual connection from end to end. So the actual path is not defined, and um, and pack, the actual path could change dynamically during the virtual connection. And because it can change, this packet reordering can happen uh, because these packets take different paths in the network and arrive at the destination out of order. So that's uh, one of the inherent factors. And of course, that can happen either symmetrically or more than likely asymmetrically. And this is what we're showing here. Uh, the ability to do asymmetric packet reordering uh, in the manner that uh, real networks actually uh, behave. Uh, here's another graphical view of what packet reordering is. Um, and here we're basically defining two ways of doing it. Okay, go ahead, Prasad. I think you wanted uh, yeah. to say something here. Uh, yeah, uh, just wanted to explain this. So this is... Uh, Packet uh, reordering basically means we take one packet, uh, hold it for some time, and then reintroduce into the stream. Uh, so it can be done either based on time uh, or uh, packet. So user can set reintroduce after a certain time or reintroduce after certain packets. So that is what this slide shows. Packet duplication, we talked about this briefly, and that it can happen for a variety of reasons. Um, once when you're trying to discover the path between um, source and destination or addressing or whatever, or 
uh, duplication can happen because of retransmissions uh, that um, are instigated by the end application, the TCP application. <clears throat> In the TCP world, there is that TCP window, <clears throat> and that window cannot be exceeded by the transmitter. The transmitter has to cease transmitting uh, until he is given authority to continue transmitting. Uh, that uh, guarantees that the destination has received all the packets. So if the destination has not received some packets, he may ask for retransmission of some or many packets. Actually, most of the, most of the time it's many packets that are retransmitted, so duplication can happen quite dramatically when there is a large TCP window and there is uh, many packets in transit. So all of those packets in transit have to be retransmitted. So this duplication uh, is an important uh, 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 is an important impairment to understand how end-to-end uh, -end applications function. And of course, we have logic error insertion, which is simply the physical link uh, if it encounters an error. And of course, here we're saying that the Wi-Fi links have a lot of error. And that is true. Um, and there, if you look at a Wi-Fi link um, or cellular links, you will see that there is a lot of retransmissions of those packets um, across the uh, very uh, varying RF. Um, um, so, uh, VJ, that's all due to the the nature of the wireless portion of that, correct? Uh, the yes, RF, yes. okay, and the variability right. of it, okay, right. Yeah, in fact, many, many, you, it's likely that a large percentage of packets will be aired and uh, dropped. Um, but, you know, I mean, the end-to-end -end application will take care of. Now, there is a certain amount of um, uh, error protection just in the RF link, and that's, but that's a different story. That's just to allow the RF link uh, some stability. They're, those are built into the LTE protocols, and um, those that's called a um, the MAC layer. Um, it's just to have a more robust MAC layer over an RF link. That's uh, slightly different than what we're talking about here, where we might be just talking about end to end. What happens end to end? Okay. Uh, logic error insertion. Prasad, do you want to talk about this a little bit? Yes. Uh, so, uh, yeah, this is the uh, setting for uh, logic error insertion. Here, uh, uh, again, um, it is based on the packet error rate. That is, uh, for example, if it is 10 power minus 3, then one out of every 1,000 packets is selected for uh, logic error insertion. And a user can specify uh, the by offset from the beginning of the frame and from the end of the frame. Uh, so uh, that window. Uh, that it is called error window we just uh, flip the bits on every byte in that uh, window uh, so again it is uh, asymmetrical so that uh, different uh, rates can be introduced in uh, both directions uh, so uh, this is uh, the scheduler which we added uh, recently and uh, that is uh, uh, so uh, here uh, uh, based on the csv file uh, which currently uh, we can um, generate uh, from the another application of ours called the multi-stream traffic generator. So uh, we can um, uh, load this uh, uh, the set of impairments from a CSV file and then uh, apply the periodicity, uh, say from one second up to 10 seconds. So at uh, every second, it will read the values from the CSV file and apply the impairments. Um, and the applied impairments are shown in a graphical format. Uh, the throughput graph uh, we display per stream in the, as a graphical representation of uh, the rate of each stream. Um, Sanjeev, can you jump on and uh, let us know if there have been any questions for for GL and, and VJ Prasad? Myself can try to answer some of these. Yeah, the first one is: uh, uh, Can we schedule the impairments uh, to be inserted at a later time? Yeah, Prasad, do you want to talk about a little bit more in detail of how, just from a application sort of point of view, how the uh, the scheduler works? Can you do things such as 
um, say I want to run it uh, the, uh, certain impairments in you know two hours from now or in the middle of the night or something like that. Can you let us know how that works? Scheduler we have added recently, so we are just starting to add uh, features to that. Uh, but currently it is like uh, uh, the impairments will uh, start immediately as soon as the user loads the file and uh, say starts. Uh, uh, so uh, to schedule the start of the impairments at a later time, uh, we are uh, it's in the plan for the short term feature and uh, we'll be adding that. We'll be adding uh, more features to the scheduler as we go ahead. As we move forward. Okay, so at, at the current time, uh, how does this Excel spreadsheet work into it? So tell us a little bit of how, how this works. What, I don't quite yeah. understand. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so um, uh, at the current point, uh, this uh, Excel sheet has uh, column, uh, columns for each impairment. Uh, and uh, currently, the uh, latency and uh, packet loss uh, are uh, they are uh, imported into the ip net sim scheduler so uh, the rows uh, have the stream uh, indexes there so each stream can have one one entry there and uh, there can be uh, repetitions for each stream any number of repetitions in the csv file and uh, that will be repeated uh, so uh, the IP NetSim scheduler goes through each row and uh, applies the uh, the set of impairments in that row uh, to that particular stream. And then uh, it does that for all the 16 streams. And after that 16, again, uh, another set of impairments for each of the 16 streams, that is the next 16 rows, uh, can be added. And that will be applied for the next period. So for example, if the periodicity is, uh, say, 10 seconds, for the first 10 seconds, the first set of impairments is applied, and the next 10 seconds, the next set of impairments, and so on, till it reaches the end of the file. And then um, user can either uh, stop at that point, or if a repeat file is uh, selected, then it will start over from the beginning. OK, very good. OK, and the, the plan is to expand on all of the scheduler features uh, as we move forward here in, in upcoming releases. So okay. yes, yes, yes. OK, uh, next question, Sanjeev, if, yeah. if there are any. Uh, yeah. Uh, can you explain the Ethernet interfaces available on the impairment simulator uh, if an SFP port is also available? Yes. I mean, I can I can take that, and then uh, Vijay, if you want to go to that slide. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So go. basically, you know, the our Ethernet um, portion here is is sort of based upon our packet expert platforms, and uh, it comes in a variety, a couple of different platforms. But we we have, as you can see here, um, for instance, on the bottom left portion, this is sort of our new 10 1G 10G product. Um, ports 1 and 2 uh, provide you the option of using a copper connection or a, there's an SF, SFP module there so that you can plug in. So SFP cage is available. You can plug in uh, an SFP module and um, or you can use a just a traditional copper connection there. And then ports 3 and 4 on the 1 gig or 10 gig ports, right? I believe um, those are they can SFPs. be 10 gig or one gig. Okay, all right. So all of these ports can. Okay, so these uh, these I don't know if my cursor is visible. Yes, it um, is. Okay, so these two port uh, these two the copper uh, normally copper these are RJ45. Uh, they can be 10, 100, or 1,000. Um, you can put uh, electrical SFPs into this. Uh, normally optical SFP slot, but uh, optical SFP slots can also handle electrical SFP. So uh, all four of the, uh, all these two could end up becoming two electrical, and ports three and four can also be electrical by putting in electrical SFPs. So in, in essence, you could have four um, <coughs> electrical SFPs uh, at all running at one gig. Or you could have uh, two at ten, uh, 
at 10 gig optical or two at one gig optical. So these, there's a lot of variations there depending on how you wanted to um, arrange your SFPs and optic, between optical and electrical. And you can have actually a multiple of these units in this MTOP unit. You could actually equip this MTOP unit with three of these units and um, up to three of these units and uh, have uh, additional, uh, you know, on the one gig, you have 16 stream capability. You could end up having uh, even more than that with uh, another one of these units in in this slot. Okay. So one of the questions that I hear a decent amount is the 16 stream, expanding mm -hmm. on that a little bit. So I, I think um, just to clarify to everyone, the 16 streams are completely independent of each other, right? There's no sort of shared... Um, um, no aspects to to those is that right? That's right. Okay. All sixteen are completely independent. The impairments are independent. Uh, uh, you can have uh, one stream completely ignored and right. Fifteen other and, streams having all sorts of variable. And so, what's the fundamental definition of a stream then? In our case here. Well, it can be almost okay. I'll have Prasad answer it, but I I think the end, correct answer is it can be almost any kind of a definition. It can be MAC addresses, it can be IP addresses, UDP addresses, um, and it can be some uh, combination thereof, uh, and or it can also be so Prasad. Do you want to elaborate on that? No, yes. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it can be uh, many fields, individual fields, like uh, the commonly used fields for stream definition, like MAC address, IP address, UDP port, or TCP port, and um, uh, yeah, and uh, say VLAN tag. Uh, and uh, one more uh, important feature is the ROM mode, where it can be anything. Actually, we have a 120 byte uh, raw hex uh, bytes. Uh, and a ma corresponding mask for each byte so that uh, and an offset so user can just set the offset say uh, uh, say the uh, uh, offset for a payload say udp payload after uh, 48 bytes set uh, set an offset for 48 bytes and define the 120 byte uh, hex mask uh, so using that user can filter any uh, bytes anywhere in the packet including the payload so, uh, so that's yeah. sort of like a deep packet definition of a stream. It could be something completely random. It could be a unique packet identity that could be a stream. And uh, you can define that in this what we call raw raw mode. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, I mean, it, it can almost be anything as long as you can... Unique, uh, well, it doesn't even have to be unique, actually. Anything that qualifies for that criteria, which is a complicated uh, Boolean expression uh, deep within the packet, as long as that uh, Boolean expression is uh, met, uh, that packet becomes part of that stream definition. And that packet is imp imp impaired according to that uh, according to the parameters for that particular stream, so-called stream. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Vijay. Thank you, Prasad. Uh, that's all. Uh, there are no more, no more questions here. Okay. Well, oh, um, okay. So I wanted to actually, I wanted to ahead. say one more thing real quickly because we didn't really touch on it. So one of the interesting uh, features that these packet experts have are this ability to, uh, we can equip these things with these TTL uh, outputs. I, we're not showing that here, um, but uh, on the back of the packet expert or in a panel, uh, these packet experts can be um, provided with uh, a TTL outputs for defining this deep packet identity, for example. And it, that- It's uh, shown here in the 2U rack, Vijay, uh, that top. Okay. Okay. Uh, that four uh, TTL outputs. Uh, oh, on the right oh, yeah, side. Oh yeah, yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, they were showing 
uh, well, we're showing one output there, but those things can be equipped with four. We can actually equip it with 12 to uh, 12. And uh, so you could, you could combine this deep packet identity, give a TTL output for it if you want, if you had such a requirement, and there are such requirements, and at the same time impair that, and, and away you go. So um, uh, those types of uh, uh, very lab-oriented, unique capability is available at no additional cost. <laughs> Sorry. Right. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, and there's TTLs. You know, obviously you can dream up some scenarios there, but they can be run to oscilloscopes or data loggers, and 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 sort of count the you know the iterations that that those happen and so mm -hmm. forth. So lots of lots of ways they're flexible in the nature. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, Sanjeev, um, any additional questions? No, Matt. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, that'll conclude today's uh, webinar. Like I say, um, we did not get to the TDM and analog sort of portion of our impairment simulators, but we will schedule those for another time. Uh, this was, you know, and thank you for everyone, uh, Vijay, Prasad, Sanjeev, John, for participating and um, the informative session on the packet ethernet WAN emulators and uh, impairment simulators that GL offers. And you can always um, give us a call um, or um, send an email easily to info at gl.com. Info at gl.com is the best way to get a hold of all of us. And if you want to have a specific question for Prasad or VJ, just send an email to info at gl.com and address it with. Um, you saw the webinar and you have a couple questions and somebody can get back to you and we can um, explain these things a little deeper if need be. So thank you again for everybody uh, participating and for everybody joining us. Uh, we will see you next month. Bye-bye.